week four of our series, Free to Be Me. Uh, uh, several years ago when we were in California, I uh, knew a guy named Jeff, and he was a part of our student ministry team, and, and he told a story once that uh, when he was in about the fourth grade, he had a, a neighbor, uh, she was a, about a year older in, in the fifth grade, named Missy, and uh, one day Missy came over to his house just to, to kind of hang out, and at this time in, in his life, Jeff and his dad, they, uh, um, they loved baseball. They, had, in fact, had just been out playing baseball, had just come home, and, and just kind of dumped everything everything, all of their, their equipment and stuff was just a, a sitting in a pile in the kitchen uh, when Missy came over, including a, a piece of equipment that's, um, it's an important piece of equipment. In fact, probably a, a maybe even say a, a critical piece of equipment for, for a guy, right? And, uh, and so uh, there's no delicate way to, to put it, I'm afraid. It's just, it's specifically designed for a guy's protection, right? And it, it's called a cup. And, and uh, if, you, if you're not aware with sports equipment, you can Google it. I'm not talking anymore about that anymore. You don't drink out of it, but Missy had no idea. Um, Missy had no idea what, what this was about. And uh, uh, you know, in those like movies, you know what, like that part of a movie when something bad is about to happen and everything, everything just kind of goes into, into slow motion. Well, that, that's what happened. Missy, uh, Missy picked up the cup and uh, everyone, yeah, kind of went scrambling, right? Trying to like, trying to reach out and trying to, to cry out to her. And they were like, put that down. Like, don't touch it. You're, you're a girl, right? Like, no, like in, in slow motion as it was going across. And Missy looked up and she was completely oblivious to, uh, to the protests of, of the people in the room at the time. And, uh, and then she, uh, she asked very innocently, she said, hey, what's this? Unfortunately, Missy answered her own question, and, and she said, oh, with a, a broad smile on her face, it's an oxygen mask, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what, what happened next. She cupped it over her mouth and began breathing, right? <laughs> Deeply, like Darth Vader, like, <gasps> oh, right? And, it was, and I know if you're, if you're here today and you're like, uh, for the first time, welcome to church. Uh, this, we, <laughs> We don't normally do this, it's just kind of, but there is a point, there really is, there's a, a point to that story, and it's this, when, when you don't know the purpose of something, what ends up happening is you misuse it, right? There, there, is, a, a, there is a point to this. Now, this is the last week of our series called Free to Be Me, and, and let me just give you a quick recap in case you haven't been here or missed some of it. In week one, uh, we kind of established that, that God says that we are chosen, and the Bible actually teaches us that God knows everything about us. And one of my favorite verses in the Bible is in Ephesians chapter one. And in that verse, God says, he says that before he laid the foundations of the earth, I mean, so appropriate to that song that we just sang, right? Before he laid the foundations of the earth, that he chose us. Right, what an incredible, incredible truth. It wasn't that God created a bunch of planets and a solar system and gravity and all this stuff and said, well, now what am I gonna do with this, right? Like, let's put some humans on it. He chose you first, that God knew you and he knew he wanted to make you and he knew he wanted to be in a relationship with you. And so he created everything else so that you would have a place to exist so that he could be in relationship with you. How incredible is that, right? And then we, we went on to say that God knows everything about you. He knows your past. He knows your present. He even knows the future. And, and the Bible teaches us that God loves us anyways. You're like, but he knows my past? Yeah, he, he knows your past. He knows my present? Yeah, your present. And he even knows what you're gonna do, the stuff that you don't even know you're gonna do, right? And, and he says, it's okay, I love you. Right? What an incredible, incredible truth. And he proved how much he loved us by sending his son Jesus and through his life and through his death and, and resurrection that we could be forgiven and we could be set free. That was week one and then week two we said, well because of that we can, we can boldly proclaim that I am valuable. I'm incredibly valuable. They, not only through faith in Jesus can we be forgiven but the Bible teaches us that we're actually adopted into God's family, that, that through a relationship with Jesus you can be called God's son or his daughter and that as a result of that, that we are heirs to everything that God is. And so when you need peace in your life, God says, yeah, I got that. I, I can, I, I'm at all the peace that you need. You say, God, I, I need strength to face this situation. He's like, well, yeah, I, I created everything, so I'm pretty strong, right? Like, I, I can be that strength. God, I need forgiveness. It's like, I, I know, I, I forgave you. And that same forgiveness that I gave to you, th that will be enough for you to forgive that person in your life. I mean, it's just incredible, incredible stuff. And from there, God goes on to say that not only is that all true, but that we are his masterpiece, right? What an amazing, amazing truths. God's, God, we believe this. God doesn't make mistakes. God's intentional in everything that he does, right? He is perfect in everything that he does. 
And so when God says that he made you his masterpiece, it, that's what he meant. He made you, you are unique, you are alone. There is no one else like you and God made you exactly the way that he wanted to make you and, and said that you are valuable. Again, he proved it. He proved it by paying the ultimate cost for you through the son, through the life of his son, Jesus. And then last week we said, because of that, right, we don't need to be prisoners of our past and we don't need to be prisoners to what other people think or say about us. That we don't need to live in that realm. We don't need to be people pleasers. In fact, we can live confidently. I'm chosen, I'm valuable, and I am confident. And I'm confident not in my own confidence, right? It's not in my own strength or what I can do. I'm confident because I can be completely satisfied in who God is. And when I'm satisfied that he is enough for me, then I can be dependent upon him and recognize that he is present in my life in everything that I face. See, here's the problem though. We can have all of those truths. They're all true about us. The problem is, is that at times in our lives, we, we don't believe them. Right? We don't believe that we are God's masterpiece. Sometimes instead, we tend to focus on our perceived deficiencies instead of what God says is true about us. We convince ourselves that God, God wouldn't use me, or perhaps that, that even if he, he could, he, he wouldn't use me, or he couldn't use me. And so we, when, we, when we haven't grasped who we are, the problem is, is that we tend to focus on who we're not. And as a result, we end up missing out on the purpose that God intended for our lives. We're not living purposefully the way that God intended, the way that God created. And so I'm gonna say it again. If you don't know the purpose of something, you end up misusing it. Whether it's through selfishness, maybe it's comparisons that we make to others. We take this masterpiece of, of what God has said is, is you and, and we throw it away. See, we don't know, when we don't know our purpose, what happens is that we tend to experiment with things. We try to, to do a bunch of different things and we try to find satisfaction by going from relationship to relationship or maybe job to job or pleasure to pleasure. And we just hope that maybe the next shiny thing, right, will be that thing that will, will bring that significance in our lives, that finally it will make a difference and, and everything will make sense. And so let me ask you this question. What if we could know for certain what our purpose is? What if we could walk into this week knowing that there is a purpose that God has for our lives and how to put that into practice, how to live that out? If you have your Bible, I'd love for you to turn with me to uh, Joshua chapter one in the Old Testament. If you don't have a, a Bible with you today, that's okay. You can download our app if you want. We've got uh, an app on, online that's got notes in it. It's got all the passages that we're gonna take a look at today. You can add your own notes to it and send it to yourself or you can just follow along on the side screens. We're gonna have all of the verses up there as well. Now, the book of Joshua, it's, it's a, a book that's more than just God moving in the life of Joshua. In fact, it's a book about what God can do in our life as well. And so let me just give you a little bit of background, a little bit of story of, of Joshua and where he is uh, at this moment when we join him in, in Joshua chapter one. The nation of Israel is about to enter the promised land. Now, they're in this place right now where they have suffered for over four centuries in slavery in Egypt. And so God sent Moses to deliver them from Pharaoh. And maybe you've seen the movie, The Ten Commandments, right? And so Moses goes in and, and God sends down these 10 plagues. And finally, Pharaoh gets to a place where he says, that's it, I've had enough, right? I can't take any, any more of this, just, just go, just leave. And so Moses leads the Israelites and they're now, they're now have been set free. And then they go and God parts the Red Sea and they cross the Red Sea on dry ground. And it says that God leads them right through a pillar of smoke during the day and a pillar of fire at night. And God provides all of the food that they're going to need. And remember back in Egypt, it was 10 plagues that God showed up to set them free. Now he gives them 10 commandments on how to live, how to follow him, how to be in relationship with God. Look at Deuteronomy chapter six. I just hang your place in, in Joshua one, but look at this verse on the side screens. Deuteronomy six, verse 20. In the future, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws the Lord your God has commanded you, tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And before our eyes, the Lord sent signs and wonders, great and terrible, on Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But look at verse 23. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land he promised on oath to our ancestors. God brought them out so that he could bring them in. He brought them out of Egypt so that he could bring them in to the promised land. 
See, God offers us the exact same thing. In the last series that we did, Pastor Mike led us through called, called Battle Tested, right? Many of us were brought out of something. That through Jesus, you were set free from something. Maybe it was anger or, or bitterness or, or depression, right? Like you were able to, to kind of walk away from that. Or maybe it was an addiction or a habit. Maybe for the first time in, in a long time, you were able to forgive that person that, that hurt you. God brought you out of something. But now God wants to bring you into something that's, that's actually even better. To live in freedom and to actually be free to be me. To discover the purpose that God has for our lives. See, for Joshua, this isn't the first time that the Israelites came to the, the promised land. They had been there before with Moses. In fact, when Moses had them there, he sent in 12 spies to go check out the land and, and see what the opposition looked like. And, and it said that the 12 spies came back and 10 of them said, they're huge, right? We're, we're scared. There's no way we can do this, right? We're very, very afraid. We, we, we should just walk away from this. Two of the 12 came back and said, yeah, they're big, but our God is bigger. Let's go, right? Well, we can do this. We trust that God's gonna give us this. One of those two that came back and believed that God was bigger than what they saw was Joshua. But because they were afraid, they ended up wandering as a nation around the wilderness for 40 years instead of going into the promised land. Look at Deuteronomy chapter one. It says this, these are the words Moses spoke to all Israel in the wilderness east of the Jordan, that is in the Arabah opposite Suf, between Paran and Tophel, Laban, Hazaroth, and Dizahab. I don't know if I said those right, but neither do you, right? And so we're just gonna keep going. We're gonna keep going. Look at verse two. This is really what I wanted to get to. I just, I felt like I had to do verse one to get to verse two. Verse two says this. It takes 11 days to go from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea by the Mount Seir Road. Verse three, look at this. In the 40th year, and just stop there for a second, right? You, I want you to notice this. I told you last week that I'm not a mathlete, right? But I can count, and I think, I think there's a big difference between 11 days and 40 years, right? There's a big difference. See, what it says in this passage is it, it only took 11 days for them to get where, from where they crossed the Red Sea to entering the Promised Land in Kadesh Barnea. It was only gonna take them 11-day journey to get from the freedom across the Red Sea to the Promised Land. But they spent 40 years wandering around in the wilderness. God brought them out of slavery for a purpose, to live in freedom in the promised land, not to walk around in the wilderness for 40 years, not to walk around the same old mountains, not to walk around the same old obstacles, not to walk around the same old hurdles for 40 years, not to live with insecurities and not to live with fears and not to live with doubts and, and inadequacies not to care what other people think or, or say about us. He didn't want them to live with bitterness or, or anger or feeling rejection or lust or greed or addictions, whining and grumbling and complaining the entire time. See, they were out of slavery, but they still weren't living free. And I think the reality is that too many Christians, too many followers of Jesus, we take 40 years to get to the place that really should only take us 11 days. And I don't mean that literally, but do you, do you see the point in that? See that through Jesus, we aren't slaves. We're not in bondage anymore. But many of us aren't living free. We don't live free until we possess the promises of God's purpose for your life. See, many of you in that last series, God brought you out of something, but he didn't leave you there in this place just to wander around for the next 40 years. He brought you out to lead you into something better. Your past doesn't determine your identity. God's promises and his purpose, that's what determines your identity. See, God's got a plan for your life and a purpose for your life that we need to begin to learn how to walk in faith so that we can be free to be me. 40 years later for Joshua, God had to raise up another generation to possess the promised land. But in the middle of all of that, right, God is, is faithful. He hasn't disappeared. God, God has done something in the life of Joshua. He was a great leader. He was a great warrior in, in their army. He was Moses' personal assistant. In fact, he was with Moses on the mountain when God gave him the Ten Commandments. God chose and prepared Joshua to lead the nation of Israel into the promised land. Look at Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses aid. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, 
you and all these people, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I am about to give them to the Israelites. See, there's two things that these verses show us here. The first is this, is that we need to let go of the past. Verse two, God says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Why? Why does God need to remind Joshua that, that Moses is dead? Joshua would have been there, right? Joshua clearly knows that Moses is dead because it's easy to hold on to the past. And to experience what God wants to do in your life, you have to be willing to, to let go of things. Moses was his leader. Moses was his mentor for over 40 years. They've been wandering around in the wilderness together. God says, I brought you out of that, Joshua, and I want you to let that go. Let me ask you this question. What in your life do you need to let go of? So you've been set free, but maybe there's something that you're still holding on to, or maybe there's something in your life that is holding you back from experiencing the freedom that God wants to give to you. Here's the second thing in this passage. Not only do we let go of the past, but we need to look forward to the future. As soon as he said, Moses, my servant is dead, he then says, now then. Now then, Joshua, I want to tell you about what's next. Joshua, I want you to look forward. Now I want to bring you into something new. I want you to get ready for what it is that I want you to receive. So you can't receive anything new until you let go of something old. Verse three, I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the West. See, for Joshua and the Israelites, this was, this was a one-time experience. They had missed it 40 years earlier, right? But God has brought them back to this place and said, guys, this is what is about to happen to you. But for us, for us, this can be a daily experience. Look at those first three words in that verse again. God says, I will give. See, we don't have to question. We don't have to wonder if God wants to give to us. We simply need to trust that God wants to give into your life, that God is an incredibly gracious and giving God. And I love the detail in this verse, that God promised to give them every place that they set their foot. He didn't say, guys, I'm just gonna give you the whole land, right? It's all yours, it's already taken care of. Why don't you just walk in from border to border? It's all yours. He said, I want you to go in and I want you to do something. You need to participate with me. Every place that you step from this edge to this edge, right? Everywhere that you go, I will give you that land, but you have to step out in faith. You need to walk the land. And I think there's a parallel in our lives. This promise isn't for us. Right? It doesn't mean that everywhere we step, that that land is automatically ours. A lot of us would do a lot more walking if that was, if that was true. Right? That, that's not what the promise is. But the promise in here for us is this, is that if we are willing to step out in faith, if we are willing to trust God, maybe it's starting that relationship that you know God's been putting on your heart. That individual that sits in the cafeteria by themselves, or maybe it's that new person that just started at your, at your place of work, that neighbor, right, that just moved in or is a couple houses down the street and, and everyone else kind of talks about them. God wants you to start that relationship. Maybe it's ending a relationship that you know needs to end. And every time you're around that person, nothing good ends up happening, right? The, the temptations, the decisions, it's all bad, the regrets that, that come from it. Maybe it's that you need to try again to fix your marriage. You need to try to be more patient. You need to give so that you can start being more generous. Maybe it's walking away from that addiction. Maybe it's sharing your faith. Maybe it's forgiving that person in your life. Until you step, you won't possess it. But when you do step into that, God promises us something, that he will join us in that. See, what or who you trust determines your actions. And so let me ask you this question. Where do you need to set your foot? What is it that God's been telling you that he wants you to take that next step, that step of faith to trust him with? See, God was sending Joshua and the Israelites into the promised land. And the reality is, is that God is sending us too. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says this, that we are Christ's ambassadors. This verse gives us part of our purpose, right? Uh, of what it means to, to, to live out our purpose is that, is that we are God's ambassadors. Now, what's an ambassador? Let me give you a definition. There's a bunch of different ones out there, but this is a simple working definition. An ambassador is a representative sent out on a mission to build relationships, right? It's someone who's representing someone else who goes out on a mission to build relationships with others. 
An ambassador is someone who goes, right? That, that's what you do. That's a, you don't stay at home as an ambassador. You go out. And I want to show you four things that ambassador goes and does through Joshua's story. Verse 5, no one, this is God speaking, no one will be able to stand against you all of the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Here's the first thing. An ambassador goes on behalf of someone important. Right, to be an ambassador, it means that I represent someone. I go on their behalf. God promised Joshua that if he would go on his behalf, that, that, he would, that there would be no one would be able to stand against him. God promised Joshua, he said, I, I'll be right there with you the entire time. Joshua, I will never abandon you. Joshua, I will never leave you by yourself. And if you read the story, you'll see that as Joshua and the Israelites go forward, they are victorious, battle after battle after battle, except for one. The one time where there was some sin in their camp. After their last battle, someone, someone didn't follow through on what God asked them to do. And so as a result, their next battle, they ended up losing. See, and I think that's important because God promised that not that Joshua's life would be perfect, not that, that it would be easy, that there were gonna be battles, but God promised that he would be with him. And that promise is the same for us. See, we're called to represent Jesus, who is God, right? In, in the very same way. And to understand this, to understand this, there's, we gotta understand there's a difference between a career and, and a calling. You might work at Taco Bell, but you're not called to Taco Bell, right? You, you may be an insurance salesperson, but you're not called to be a, a sales or an insurance salesperson. There's a difference between your career and your calling. Several years ago, we took a, a group of students on a missions trip to India. And the missionary that took us, that, that kind of led the trip, he was American, but he had moved with his family uh, to India. And I remember that he described himself like this. He said, I'm an ambassador for Jesus disguised as a businessman. I loved that. Right? I thought that was such a great description. What if we saw ourselves that same way? That you're an ambassador for Jesus, but you're in disguise. You're a follower of Christ, right? That's your primary calling. You're an ambassador of Jesus, but you're just simply disguised as a, as a mom or as a nurse, as a truck driver or a mechanic or as a realtor or a salesperson, whatever it is, you're an ambassador of Jesus. That's your identity. That's who you are. That's your calling. You're just disguised as something else. See, if you're gonna follow Jesus as an ambassador, we have to understand and recognize it is gonna affect our lives. It's gonna affect every part of our lives. We have to represent Jesus. We represent him in the things that we say, and we represent him in the things that we do, in how we carry ourselves. Every act and action matters. We have friends that used to say to their kids, every time they would go out, remember who you represent. See, our purpose is to represent Jesus. Everywhere we go, we represent Jesus, which leads to the second part of, of an ambassador. Verse six, God said, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land that I swore to their ancestors to give to them. Here's the second thing. An ambassador goes on mission. An ambassador goes on mission. Right. You're given a mission. Ambassadors that, that go on and represent our, our nation, right? They go on diplomatic missions. Uh, when they do that, in fact, the embassies that they stay in, that they work out of, are actually called permanent missions. Right? When they go forth, they go on mission. The moment you step across that line spiritually and you become a follower of Jesus, God gives you a mission for your life. Your mission, if you choose to accept it. Right? Could, could you imagine if every single day like you heard the Mission Impossible theme song as you like, get in your car and you're like driving to work, you're like, doo, 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 doo. you're like, yeah! Like, right? like, I'm on mission everywhere I go every single day. Because that's what we are. When you're on mission, that's all that matters is the mission. You don't go to places just to look at the scenery, right? You don't go to take selfies of yourself and just to try the different types of, of food. When you're an ambassador, you go on mission. For Joshua, his mission was to lead the people into the promised land. And God told him to go with strength and with courage, which means it wasn't gonna be easy, but this was his mission. See, of all the missions in the world, some are very, very important, but I think the most important mission of all is helping people to get to know God and to settle their eternity, their eternal destiny. Because they're only gonna be on earth for so many years. But we're all going to be eternal. 
2 Corinthians 5, this is the verse we looked at earlier, but I wanna look at a few more verses with it. Beginning at verse 17, says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a, a new life has begun. All of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. See, that's our mission. If you've ever wondered, what, what am I supposed to do while I'm here, right? Like, I, uh, after you became a believer, like, I accepted God's salvation, right? I know that I'm forgiven. I know that I'm going to spend eternity with God. Why doesn't he just take us then, right? Like, why doesn't it just end then? Right? You gave your life to Christ, like, boom, straight up, right? Like, just, just done. Why does he leave us here for another 20, 30, or however many years, right? With all of the, the suffering and the sorrow and the sadness and the, and the sin and the depression, like, why, why doesn't God just take us because we have a mission and it's more important than any other mission in the world our mission is to love people where they are that might be in your family it might be at the school that you go to or, or, or where you work see they already have enough stress in their lives they're already feeling the pressure right they understand loneliness they know that their lives are broken they don't need us to, to either ignore them or, or to come and, and judge our mission is to love them, to be kind, to be compassionate, to serve people right, right where they are, and to help them discover what it is that we have discovered, a God who loves them so much that through Jesus' death and resurrection that we can be forgiven and restored in our relationship with him. See, one day when you stand before God, he's gonna ask you, did you complete the mission that I gave to you? And you're not gonna be able to say, oh, God, I, I didn't know I had one because I just ruined that for you. You now know that you have a mission, right? So I apologize, but you're gonna be held accountable for that. Do you think when you get there that God's gonna say, do you think your life was just about yourself? I think we all know inside that no, it's not just about us. That God's gonna say that your mission on earth was to love people the way that I loved you. So you represent Jesus when you live on mission. Here's the third part, verse seven. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. So here's the third part. An ambassador goes with authority. Here's the, the second be strong and courageous that God gives to Joshua. In fact, he even ups it a little bit on this one. He's like, be strong and, and very courageous. See, to understand and to live out our purpose, we need to know what it is that God has, has promised us. See, there's only two things that are eternal. The first is people, right? We're all eternal. And the second thing that's eternal is, is God's word. And so the only way for us to live out our mission and, and love people where they are is that we have to go in the authority of God's word. And so he promises Joshua success, right? He says, Joshua, if you, if you allow my words to change you from the inside out, he said, Joshua, if you obey them, if you keep it in front of you, don't, don't veer to the right or, or to the left, right? But if you allow it to shape and to guide your life, Joshua, if you meditate on it day and night, you, you'll be successful in everything that you do. It's a different success than how our world would define success, right? But, but what it is, is it's God's, God's word is an instruction manual on how we can have the greatest life possible. See, but it's not just information that God is giving to us. He also gives us the power to allow it to change our lives, and change us and make us better. See, according to God, this is the key. This is the key to success. You will never live out your purpose in this life without understanding God's promises. So let me ask you this question. Is God's is God's word alive to you? Are you spending regular time reading it? Are, are you meditating on it? Are you obeying the things that God has told you to do? Again, I, I don't think it's always gonna be easy. That's why God, God told Joshua for the second time, be strong and, and very, very courageous. But the only way to live out our purpose is knowing what God has promised. 
Gary Vett says all the, the time that God never asks you to do anything that he hasn't modeled or, or told you the benefit of before he asks you to do it. And we wanna help you get started. If you haven't been reading God's word, we, we, we wanna help you get started. In fact, um, Dr. Neil Anderson, who Pastor Mike studied under, he has a, a great new devotional book that will help you uh, do two things. One is, is get started reading and, and meditating on God's word. The second is it will help you uh, understand God's promises of who he says you are and what your identity is. And so we don't have them at any of the campuses this weekend, but you can simply go online and order it. It'll be at your home by the time you get home today. And so um, I, I can't guarantee that, actually. I, 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 shouldn't, I shouldn't say it. But what I can guarantee, what I can promise is this, that you won't find your purpose in life outside, outside of God's word. An ambassador goes representing Jesus. They go on mission and they go in the authority of God's word. And, and here's the last thing, Joshua 1 verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So here's the fourth one. An ambassador goes to a foreign culture. For some of you, that's going to be your school. Your history class feels like a, a foreign culture. Or maybe you have a, a professor that every single week he discredits God or God's word. Maybe, maybe it's just eating lunch in the cafeteria. The conversations that you have every Monday and Tuesday about the, the epic parties, right, that, that happened uh, last weekend. And then from Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, it's the prediction of the next epic party, and you're kind of caught in that. Every day you're faced with decisions that, that are going to test how you represent Jesus. But look what it says. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. For some of you, it's going to be at work this week. The temptation or the, the frustration that comes when your boss takes credit for the work that you did. Or maybe it's just the, the lack of appreciation for all that you do on a regular basis. The gossip, the, the topic of conversations that, that comes up all the time. The pressure to cut corners. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. For many of us, we're gonna face it in our relationships. Parents who would disagree with your faith a boyfriend or a girlfriend who just don't understand why you don't do what, what everyone else does, right, in your relationship. A marriage that can be saved, but it's gonna take a lot of work. Friends who, who take what you shared in confidence and they, they pass it around to other people. The envy and the judgments that we're tempted to make based on what someone posted online. That neighbor who, who just does things to intentionally get under your skin. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. See, what we need to remember is that God is, is God. He's in control and he chose for us to represent him. He chose the times and the locations that we would be alive. God planted us here by his design for his purpose. He knows everything that you're facing in your life. And he decided that you would be the most effective person to be his salt and his light in a dark and broken world. See, as followers of Jesus, we may feel like we're living in a, in a foreign country at times, right? Just the culture that we live in. Sometimes it's hard and it's hurtful and, and it's cruel and it's confusing. But we can hold on to the promise that God gave to Joshua. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. See, we weren't created to keep Jesus to ourselves. This was never intended to be a private thing that we hold on to. We were created to go live on mission and to show his grace and his love in a broken world. We are called to be willing to share the hope that we have in Jesus with anyone and everyone who needs it. And this Easter, we're gonna have the opportunity to invite 20,000 people to come and hear about this incredible grace and this incredible Love. And you may ask, well, why is that such a big deal, Donnie? Is it just so we can brag? So we've got like the biggest church in the, in the area? No, it has nothing to do with that. The reason why this is such a big deal is because every one of those people needs to hear what God has brought them out of and what it is that he wants to bring them into. And they're gonna have the opportunity. We are gonna have the opportunity. And there's no greater gift, right, than to invite the people that we love and we care about to come and hear about the opportunity that they can have to have their lives changed by Jesus the way that he has changed ours. See, God says this about you. You are chosen. You're valuable. And that you can live confidently 
And finally, he says that you are his ambassador in this world, disguised as whatever it is that you need to wear as your disguise. But we don't hide. We don't hide from people. We're called to go out and to love people the way that Jesus loved us. I believe that if we do this daily, if we put these things into practice, then we truly will be free to be me. And not, not free based on what I think about myself, not free based on what other people say about me, but free based on what God has said is true about who I really am. Free to show and to share God's love and his grace everywhere we go. Here's how I wanna close this series. See, this series really is, it's only scratched the surface of the things that God has said about you, the things that are true about you. Here's what I want you to do. I want you just to close your eyes right now. We're gonna pray in, in just a second, but I, I, want you to, I want you to listen to a few more things that, that God has said. These are all things straight out of his word that are true about you. We're gonna, we're gonna put this on our, on our app um, so you can go back and, and follow this. You, you probably are gonna wanna read through these on, on a daily basis, but it's, it's from Neil Anderson's list of, of things that, of who I am in Christ. Just listen to these things. I am the salt and light of the earth. I am a branch of Jesus Christ the true vine and a channel of his life. I have been chosen and appointed to bear fruit. I am a personal witness of Christ. I am God's temple. I am a minister of reconciliation for God. I am God's coworker. I am seated with Jesus Christ in the heavenly realm. I am God's workmanship. I may approach God with the freedom and confidence. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am God's child. As a disciple, I am a friend of Jesus Christ. I have been justified, declared righteous. I am united with the Lord and I am one with him in spirit. I have been bought with a price and I belong to God. I am a member of Christ's body. I am a saint. I have been adopted as God's child. I have direct access to God through the Holy Spirit. I have been redeemed and forgiven of all of my sins. I am complete in Christ. I am free from condemnation. I am assured that God works for my good in all circumstances. I am free from any condemning charges against me. I cannot be separated from the love of God. I have been established, anointed, and sealed by God. I am hidden with Christ in God. I am confident that God will complete the good work he started in me. I am a citizen of heaven. I have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. I am born of God, and the evil one cannot touch me. I can find grace and mercy in time of need. And Paul wrote this in Ephesians 3.20, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we will ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever, amen. God, we just thank you for what it is that you have said is true about us. Father, you chose us. You gave us our value and our worth. We can live confidently as ambassadors that represent you living on mission everywhere we go. Father, thank you that you brought us out of something, but not just to leave us on our own. You brought us out of something so that you could bring us into something even better. And God, we thank you for that. Thank you for your incredible mercy and grace. And Father, may we, as a result of who you are, what you have done and what you have said is true about us. May we truly live and be free to be me. Jesus, we love you and we thank you and pray all these things in your name.